All right, so today's talk for me, designing great UX into your board game and pieces, game board and pieces. So first, who am I? This is my first board game uh, track to be talking to, so I actually haven't had a chance to meet a lot of you, and a lot of you haven't obviously met me. Um, I started way back on judge and jury decision making, like how juries would make decisions in cases involving complex scientific testimony like DNA evidence or economic damage models. I burned out of that and joined a bunch of other grad school, psychology grad school burnouts at Microsoft Game Studios, uh, and we worked in the usability and play testing labs there, and we basically studied how groups of people played games and what made the games fun and what made them not fun. I decided I wanted to build a bunch more games actually and learn how they're made, so I joined up with Big Huge Games and as a sort of producer, designer, UX person, shipped a bunch of uh, PC and console games, burned out of that, went to Amazon, learned about social computing, so how do we encourage people to, oh, no, but, I don't know. So how do you encourage people to, uh, oh, do you need, oh, stick this in, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. All right. Uh, now I've got to figure out how this guy goes. Okay. All right, yeah, so went to Amazon, learned things like, you know, how do we convince people to write better reviews or to convince people who haven't ever written a review before to write a review or to upload a video of them demonstrating a project product? And then how do we, on the consumer side, help surface that information to purchasers in their buying pipeline so they can make a more informed purchase decision? Uh, Mist Games went to Zynga where I did more social games. It was kind of related a little bit to the stuff I was working on at Amazon and then ended up at Disney Mobile, made some mobile games, and then for the past five years or so, I have been a consultant. The things that I do, I study human beings. I like watching people do things. Um, I identify user experience issues. I recommend fixes to teams. Um, I mentor game designers, PMs, uh, and UXers and provide some sort of strategy so that we can figure out how to mesh your business and creative goals with your actual user experience, the way people perceive and interact with things. Why I do it, the top reason is probably the same reason why you all are in it. We love games, right? So that's number one. Um, I love watching people play games. I might have mentioned that a few times already. And uh, I love helping people make games. I'm not the person with the idea for a great, the next great game, but I love helping people achieve their goals. Um, one thing I don't do is make board games. Uh, I do run an elementary school board game club uh, and they make games uh, and I give them little like hints or suggestions or whatever and it's super fun but I myself don't actually make them. Um, maybe I can get some part marks for doing some digital versions of board games. So Catan is something that I worked on for Xbox Live Arcade, helped out with you know, how do you make the trade interface understandable and fun? How do you communicate with people across different languages? Uh, also heavily involved in designing the tutorial and onboarding experience for new players who'd never played before. Uh, similarly with the Star Wars card battler that existed for maybe a month or two, um, you know, again, you know, player progression, combat, how do you get people into the core loop of the game, but also, you know, the tutorial and onboarding. And the reason why I'm focusing a bit on the tutorial and onboarding is that it gets, when I, a lot of my work that I was doing this year, me to think about the ideal way of learning, and it's learning as you play, not learning then playing, right? Learn as you play. And this can happen in board games, right? We all have the friend, or maybe you are the friend, who is very knowledgeable about games, knows all the games, knows all the rules. Not only knows all the rules, but is really good at teaching the rules and teaching them in the context of actually playing the game. So that it's actually a fun experience to get onboarded to a new game. Um, but typically, or, or fairly commonly, right, we're all learning the game together and trying to struggle to figure it out. And you can see, you know, this is a familiar scene to folks, right? Piecing things together, someone's scouring through the rule book, and uh, hoping that at some point or other you'll get to fun gameplay. So the board game exercise that I'm gonna be talking about today is something that I've run on all sorts of different groups, elementary school kids, college students, um, game industry professionals, other UX professionals, I've run them in cities all over the world. Uh, it sounds exciting, it's not that exciting, except for me because I like watching people play games. Um, the basic exercise is this, the players group up, I give them a game that they've never played before, and I tell them how to figure out, go figure out how to play, you got 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and I observe players without helping them. So uh, no manual, and they can ask me questions, but I'm not gonna answer any of them. Uh, after about 20 or 30 minutes, when I see that all the teams have some sort of game going on and they're playing, 
Uh, we break it down. So um, the team explains what they came up with based on the board game and pieces. We diff the version that they came up with with the actual rule set. And then we discuss how the board and the pieces helped or hurt their learning of the game, where it steered them right and where it steered them wrong. Um, and then we brainstorm fixes together. So why would I be so cruel? Like, why would I bring board games that we all love and put them in front of people who've never played them before and force them to struggle? As it turns out, um, as we'll find out at the end, this is a super enjoyable exercise for people, a, a wide variety of people. Um, it's fun to play with these essentially toys because they're just pieces and boards. Um, but my biggest, the reason why I do this, and it's been kind of something that I've you know, talked about for years and years, is I believe that game improvement only comes through pain transference. So we need to take the pain from the player and put it on the shoulders of the developer. Um, and also, we're designing these days for a world where no one reads. Um, and so what other tools do we have? Well, of course, the board and the pieces. So my background is more traditionally in video games. Um, and the neat thing about vi video games is they have board and pieces, but they also have computer feedback, right? Which helps a lot. When you're playing a board game, the board game doesn't necessarily give you feedback um, actively based on your decisions. Um, so for Pac-Man, for instance, on the left, um, you know, the game starts, whether I'm holding the joystick or not, my Pac-Man starts swooping off. I hear the bloop, bloop, bloop of, button, of things being eaten. I see them disappearing. I see the score incrementing. Um, I might notice that there's some interesting blinking things that maybe I should investigate at some point. But whoa, there's this red, angry-looking ghost, and he's coming at me. I should probably avoid him. Uh, and the other thing I want you to notice about that is the cherry at the bottom right. Um, the, this is, you know, in terms of progression, right? So we've set, the, we've set the mode on easy to start with. So new people coming into the game will have a better chance of surviving for a bit and figuring it out. If we started on peach or pretzel, new players would just get wiped out before they could even figure out how to play the game. On the right, you have StarCraft, right? You start in a world, you have a little base, you've got a bunch of machines going, they're gathering things, they're bringing to the base. You can see the counters on the right, that we're accumulating resources. Maybe I can use those resources to build things. You start to see the edge of the map, the fog of war. It's like, oh, there's more to this. Maybe I should go out exploring. And then you look at the mini map on the bottom left, and you're like, oh, this is a big world. And there might be other people who are not my friends out there, and I need to be careful. Um, and the other thing is, too, to, you know, talking again about how to, to make content so that it's easier for people to learn how to play. They, StarCraft starts always with the Terrans, the humans. They're the most human-like, and they have a very traditional build structure. Um, so people can get a sense of the game before they start to introduce them to the more exotic races. Um, so how does this apply to the board gaming context? Um, so these are three of the games that I use. Uh, I use a variety of games. Um, I'm going to talk most, more about Castle Panic and Cartagena, not about Deus Ex today. Um, but how, yeah, how does this translate? And as it turns out, like, as most of you know, this is probably the first thing that you all do when you open up a new box, right? Most people, most of these groups that I ran who'd never played these games before knew to assemble the board in a way that made sense. They knew to match like things together. And with this, uh, their sort of intuitive first guesses, they started to figure out like what kind of game this is and how they might begin to play it and maybe what some of the victory conditions are. The question I have, though, is how do we go from here, where you're sorting the cards, it's all new and exciting, to here, where you're actually having fun, enjoying the game, learning the strategy, having your sodas and popcorn? Um, so from my perspective, when I think about game user experience, the, the largest job that I tend to do, and a lot of us tend to do, is what I call removing the suck, right? There are just a lot of sucky things about figuring out the game, and they're not intentional by the game designers. Um, but the problem is, is that the designer has the world in, 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 in their mind, and players have to sort of share that world and be a part of it. And there are a lot of things that can impede that sharing. So for instance, like, is this a great initial experience of a game? Like, I bought a game because I wanted to learn, I wanted to play as a pirate escaping from a medieval dungeon, right? I didn't want to buy a game to read a whole bunch of rules. So when I wrote, when I put Cartagena through these groups, here are some of the things that emerged. Uh, the pause, on the positive side, board setup was super intuitive, right? They have all these pieces, puzzle pieces that fit together nicely. People figure that out quickly. Oops. Ah. The, um, yeah, they figured that out. They figured out that there's some sort of maze aspect to it. And you start at one end, and where you want to get is to the boat, because the boat's how you escape, see? 
then you can see one person's holding cards in their hand and they say, okay, you know, we'll deal out some cards, we'll spend some cards to move our pieces around and somehow or other we'll figure out how we draw cards to replenish our hand. Uh, and the victory conditions are, you know, get on the boat. Oops. So a couple of things emerged though that were troublesome for, for groups and, and how they got things wrong when they're figuring it out. The first thing was is that um, the icon flavoring. So this is one of the, it's a theme that I'm gonna talk about a couple more times. That where art and UX can be in conflict. So the idea is you got a bunch of pirates, you're trying to escape, but they're pirates. So they see shiny objects on the ground and maybe they pause and take a look and examine it for a second. And it makes sense, there's keys you know, to treasure chests, uh, there's gems, there's bottles of rum. Uh, but where people got stuck was on the skull, for instance. So if you see the skull on the board, um, they thought if they landed there, maybe they would die, right? Um, and then if you look at the gun and the knife uh, cards, they thought, well, this game must involve combat because like, why would we have knife and gun cards if we couldn't attack other pirates, right? Well, actually none of that exists in the game, right? These are just all abstract things that, that pirates might collect on the way out of the dungeon. Um, and so it led them to come up with different rules and, and ways to play the game, some involving combat even. Uh, and they created card battler games out of Cartagena. Uh, and then the core mechanic of drawing cards um, and playing cards. They understood that playing cards move them forward on the board, but they didn't understand, and who could blame them if you haven't played Cartagena before, the way that you get new cards is you move your player backwards to the closest occupied space and you get that number of cards. Not very intuitive. But once you learn it, it makes sense. So the teams came up with suggestions. One is, you know, hey, let's just remove the misleading icons. Why do we need a, a skull and a gun and a knife? We can replace them with a crown and a treasure map and a goblet or something like that. Um, and the other thing for the card drawing rules, they already included this arrow card, which you had to read the rules to understand why it even existed or how to use it. Well, replace that with, you know, a quick re reference card uh, that explained the basic rules of moving forward by spending cards getting cards by moving backwards. King of Tokyo was another game uh, that I ran a whole bunch of. Again, it's a beautiful manual, but you know, what can we figure out without that manual? Um, so really intuitive, you know, the idea this is a monster brawl game, the, the figures are all posed like they wanna kill each other. There's Tokyo, it's on fire, so they're trying to invade Tokyo, obviously. Um, there's a bunch of dice that look exciting. They have claws, which are the way you damage people, of course, and hearts, the way you heal yourself. Um, and, you know, there's monsters, and you win the game by killing all the other monsters, right? The things that didn't go so well here was um, one of the core mechanics is these special cards. So you see the, the four energy zombify card. People intuitively thought that, well, this is here, so we're going to deal them out to everyone, everyone has a, a, deck of, a handful of cards that we'll play with. Well, actually you're supposed to collect, when you roll the dice, you're supposed to collect energy cubes based on the number of energy bolts you roll and then spend those during your turn to earn those cards. Um, and so it was, we, we, we figured out that it was the, the disconnect between going from bolt to cube to then bolt again on the card that caused some confusion there and people didn't necessarily get that. Um, they knew that you could enter and exit Tokyo and that not everyone could live in Tokyo, but they didn't know the rules for why people would come into Tokyo and why they would have to leave. Um, and then victory conditions, they understood when you look at the top card there and you see the 19 beside the star in blue, they understood that went from zero to 20. They're like, well, zero is probably where you start and 20 is probably where you win, but how do we get those victory points? And really, you know, we have like cryptic clues on the bottom left of the map there where you've got the arrow and one star and then the square brackets and the plus two stars, um, but you know, they were a little bit cryptic. Also, there was no way for them to guess that um, the numbers on the dice actually referred to victory points and you needed to get sets of three or more to get earn some victory points. So some of the suggestions we came up with was, well, if you're already kind of torn between like you don't wanna ruin the art of your game by putting a whole bunch of UX elements on it, right? You've already made the decision to put some icons and text on there why not just actually make it sort of stand out and clean it up a bit uh, so that it, people can figure out what's going on by looking at it and it's not quite so cryptic. Uh, and that's the bottom left that I'm referring to there. Um, iconography, so for energy for instance, why not have it always be cubes, right? So the dice have a cube on it, the card has a cube as the icon and then you've got these cubes. That's one way to go about it. Uh, the other way is the aftermarket way. You can actually buy, I don't know how many of you guys, you all play, uh, King of Tokyo, but you can buy the little aftermarket lightning bolts, energy bolts, so that you can have this consistent experience. 
Um, and then the victory points, you know, the dice, the, you know, how do we make it so that the dice indicate that you're like, you, there's a way to get victory points to the dice, maybe coloring them. We weren't really sure, we, but there's some sort of pattern matching or coloring and making that consistent with the color of the, uh, of the victory points. Castle Panic was next. So a lot of the positives here, people really, you know, quickly picked up and learned a lot about the game just by looking at the board. They looked at the middle of the board, it said castle, okay, you know, this, we've got a castle, um, there's monsters who are gonna enter, they're gonna enter from the forest far away from the castle, right, that made sense, and monsters are gonna move towards the castle and attack the castle. Um, they understood that by looking at the cards that they would get, they used the cards to combat the monsters and there were certain zones that they could attack based on what card they had. Um, and the victory conditions, interestingly enough, almost every group that I played with this all, ever knew it was cooperative right from the beginning. They knew it was the world against them. A couple of them riffed on some ideas about player versus player, but you know, almost uh, unanimously they were, um, they knew it was a cooperative experience. Uh, problems. So uh, the board set up, um, you can see on the circle here at the bottom right, they have all the walls and the towers on the outside um, which is not exactly correct. You want the walls on the outside and then the towers are kind of the keep in the middle and it's when the keep falls down entirely that that's when the game's over. Um, the rules of play, so the help text, they had actually help text both on the board and in these player cards that they, you know, everyone could take their little player reference card. Um, but they were vaguely wor worded and they were worded more for reminding as opposed to learning. So they had more vague statements like draw up. Well, how many cards do I draw? How many cards am I supposed to have? They had um, uh, play cards. Well, how am I supposed to play the cards? Am I supposed to use them to attack or do other things? Uh, they had a, uh, one that's move monsters. Well, how many do I move? Do I move all of them, some of them? Do I, you know, what do I do? And then another problem that emerged was combat resolution. So you've got these trolls that look big and they count to one, two, and three, and then you've got orcs who are smaller and they're one and two. Um, and, but, you know, what are those numbers really mean? Are they hit points? Are they strength? Is that how much damage they do? Is it both? So some of the suggestions that the group came up with uh, were um, first, you know, marking the board. So again, this is another art versus UX kind of trade-off thing where, you, you know, maybe there's ways that we can elegantly, so that it looks nice, put some silhouettes of where the footprints of the walls versus the keep pieces would go. Uh, decoupling the hit points from attack. So imagine if we used on the bottom right here, if we used you know, specific icons to indicate damage, the cards dealt those damage to the icons, and then you map those icons onto the, the pieces. Um, and then tidying up the help text wording to make it relevant to both, uh, or useful to both new players and you know, returning players who might have just forgotten some of the rules. So adding things like drop to five max cards, uh, move all your monsters. Uh, and finally, Quirkle, um, a really neat game. Uh, anyone who, I mean, every group always had at least a few people, if not everyone, who'd played Dominoes or Mahjong or something like that. And so they quickly figured out, uh, you know, okay, we got a tile pile in the middle, we draw them, we make racks, and then we match them together and somehow we win or lose. That was the problem though. These pieces are so abstract that there were like an infinite number of ways they could possibly put them together. And so they spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the rules of this game were. And that meant that they couldn't really figure out scoring or, or you know, um, when the game was supposed to end. And this was a case where we kind of threw our hands up in the air. We're like, board and pieces? Well, there really are only pieces and there's not much we can do with those that might, you know, that won't even make it more confusing potentially. Um, but we did talk about optimizing the scoring sheet. You can see on the left, the Quirkle score sheet's pretty generic, it's just columns of numbers, it doesn't really have any guidance whatsoever about scoring and how to play the game. Whereas you can play that, compare that with the Roll Through the Ages one, you've got both scoring and some rules that are helpful. So how does this help you? I mean, none of you, I don't think, are gonna like, you know, come up with the next Cartagena expansion or whatever. The reason why I'm presenting this stuff is more about to talk about a process that might be useful to you. And it's a process that supplements your normal playtesting. So you don't use this pro process for like early game development when you're iterating with your core group of designers um, and trying to figure out what are the fun and interesting strategic things about a game that you wanna make. And they're not about balanced feedback or about testing for degenerate conditions or golden, uh, golden paths or anything like that. Um, the idea is to help you think differently about your design decisions um, and think hard about the trade-offs between art and usability. 
um, and rely less on the, well, we'll just solve it with the manual kind of mentality or people will Google it to figure it out. Uh, with the end result being, let's make it easier for people to pick it up and play it because you can't ship yourself with the game. So in terms of directing your energies, uh, I consider the gold standard to be you know, iterating on the board and pieces themselves. Uh, when you fix the, the issues at the top of the funnel, it means you can make for more efficient use of any kind of additional documentation, right? If, if, if you can clarify a whole bunch of stuff through the actual board, that means you can eliminate maybe sections of the manual and replace it with things that people will, that are known to struggle with. And so you can prioritize uh, what content goes into the manual and you can actually cut with confidence like, things that maybe don't need to appear there because you only have limited space. Uh, the late production iteration is more costly than earlier iteration, but there's new tools to make it cheaper, like laser cutters and 3D printers. This is from Matt Leacock. His, it was a paper prototype forever, a chariot racing game, and he, he got a, himself a Kickstarter laser cutter and made himself a fancy little board and everything. Uh, another er vector of attack is you know, QRCs, scorecards, and help text, right? Remember when you're designing these, it's for two audiences. One is for the players who want to learn how to play the game, but the other is it's, sometimes it's a party game or something like that. It comes out only during social events and you don't maybe play it more than once every few months. Um, and it's a mix of new and, and experienced players to it. The reminders are different than the learning how to play, and so make sure you're designing for both and testing for both. This is also from Matt Leacox here, uh, The Roll Through the Ages. He's got a really cool time-lapse video on his website that shows 24 different iterations of this card. Um, so it's important to keep iterating through these during, during your play sessions. The fancy manual. Um, when I worked in video games at the beginning, we actually shipped paper manuals with games. That hasn't happened in years. Um, but the only things I ever cared about were the centerfold, right? It had to be controller mapping layout. And then the last page had to be the like, oh my god, I'm stuck. Like we need to have the top three things that we know get, people get stuck on and list them there. So if people, because my thought was if you're, gonna, you're only going to go to the manual if you're stuck, right? So we might as well make it easy. The other thing you can do with the manual is kind of repurpose it a little bit. I talked a little bit about you know, how you can, um, when you focus on the UX at the higher levels, it means that you can streamline your manual, maybe even cut sections of your manual and replace it with other stuff, like the stuff that people find confusing. But also, I think it's really useful to consider adding these quick start modes to your game. I, learned, I sort of first learned about this when I was uh, working on Catan for Xbox Live, and I discovered that one of the later versions of Catan actually started with the the starting map for beginners, and it's a nice balanced board. It takes away the early decisions that are like overwhelming to users, like where do I put my initial settlement and road? Um, and it makes it so that players start collecting resources right away because it's a balanced board. Um, and then they, so they start building things early, trading early, and gets them really into the fun parts of it early on. And so investing more time into that kind of mode would be great, if you, especially if you can reduce the content you need to include as the traditional manual. And then for your digital content, um, it, again, this sort of helps you streamline, like, you know, but before, when, between when my game ships and, or hits the shelves and now, uh, you know, I might only have time to make one or two videos. What videos do I make in terms of explaining the game? Well, you'll have studied, you'll know what the, some of the key problems are, and you'll get a chance to make those videos to supplement that. Um, I talked a lot about uh, making, you know, finding the suck and eliminating the suck, but one of the other cool things about doing these exercises, and this is what I'm going to wrap up on, is that actually you get a chance to see people using what you've made in delightful ways that might be totally unexpected. Um, so in Cartagena, we had some people who experimented with the tiles and said, well, what if an earthquake happened or something happened where we shifted around the tiles partway through the game based on an event? Um, we had another group who said, well, this isn't a free-for-all game, this is a team game. And we've got the, team, the pirates on the right team and the pirates on the left team racing toward the boat, fighting each other over the boat, and the first one to leave, you know, the first team to, to get on the boat and, and leave the island win. Um, not necessarily what Cartagena was going for, but these are ideas for expansions maybe that you can make or other ideas, maybe you've got some other game ideas you're noodling on and some of these mechanics might inspire you to try something different. And the final one is... <laughs> Now, I doubt the inventor of Quirkle really wanted to make Jenga out of Quirkle, but maybe that the inventor of Quirkle's like, you know, Jenga's a pretty fun game. Quirkle, I like. Maybe there's some new variant of Jenga that I can make up. And so it gives you new ideas and creative ways to sort of expand what you do. Uh, and I'll end on that so we have a few minutes left to uh, take some questions.
you know, sort of. Do you want people to come up to the mic? No, okay, I'll just repeat the question, so if you can shout it out or you can feel free to come to the mic. Hey, um, I was just wondering if there's any um, common UX pitfalls that you saw amongst all the games you were testing. That is the million dollar question. So the question's about, you know, are there common pitfalls? And I think if I could write that book, I would probably be like a millionaire and retired a million times over, right? But I think the biggest thing is, is having this as part of your process because you start to, within your own genre of game and the games that you make, you start to learn the patterns of what happens. So that's one thing is, that, you know, I can't give you a common answer, but I can say that the process works if you let it work. But one of the common things is kind of where I talk about this, the, you've, usually it's a creative direction problem where it's like, we want the game to be immersive, and so we want the art to be beautiful, but also we want the game to be immersive and we want it to be understandable. And that conflict right there, you know, how much art is too much art and, devi and, and distracts you away from, from actually learning how to the game play. And as I mentioned during some of those examples, that was, those were some key issues. It's like the art looked great, but it was unintentionally distracting and not in a, great, not in a good way. I don't know if this is working. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so I noticed that you were saying that for for the tests, at least, you take the rule books out, but leave the quick reference cards in. Would you say that quick reference cards are superior to rule books? And if you could simplify it enough, would you say a game would be better if it was just two or three quick reference cards with no rule book at all? Uh, that's an interesting question. So you know, could we just reduce or eliminate the need for manual and have these awesome quick reference cards? I think that would be great. I think you're always gonna need some sort of manual, especially for, like there are some games that just don't lend themselves well. I picked specifically games that, you know, they take an hour to play, they're more party-ish games, they're not as deep. Um, and I think for those types of games, yes, exactly that. You wanna move away from the manual into just like, let's start sorting things out and figuring out how to play from the cards themselves. So I can't give you like the overall, like I don't, like I'm fighting for a world where we never have to have another, no, I'm not arguing for that at all. Uh, but I think there are definitely classes of games where it's not necessary to have one, or that doesn't have to be the expectation that I need to read the manual before I can learn how to play it. Uh, why, hi, I'm Christoph from Asimode Poland. Uh, have you thought while this testing about the, some information that you put on a board is language dependent, yeah? And while developing the game, you wanna keep some of the components language independent, yep. not language neutral. Have you find any, do you, can you tell us any, any good thoughts about that that you, that you saw while you were exploring this topic? Yeah, that's a good question. So about localiz game localization, and, and obviously it's much cheaper and more streamlined to be able to design a game once and ship it across all languages. Um, the suggestion that some of the teams made for, for King of Tokyo where we're, you know, let's tidy up the wording or some of the, 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 the cards for um, Castle Panic. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation when you wanna focus on words themselves as a, a solution. Um, first of all, just because like words, you know, can clarify things, but people read the words as like the, you know, Moses from the mountain kind of thing. And so if you, if you write something in a way that doesn't exactly make sense, you, you might actually harm them more than help them. In terms of localization though, we didn't see any specific trends. Um, we just noticed that um, it's, I think as a process thing, you'll just wanna iterate more on them to make sure that those nonverbal hints are being effective and effectively conveying what you want. And one thing that we struggle at is that like on the King of Tokyo board, it's like those icons were kind of meaningless to people and they didn't really explain what was going on. Now again, that also, you bring that back to the fact that, you know, as a reminder, it works great if I already know the rules basically, but as a new player to discover them, and then you just make the trade off yourself, you say, well, yeah, we you know we can't we can't localize this across a bunch of languages, and so we're just gonna we're gonna just for the sake of the business, um, we're gonna make sure that we just you know use the localizable the the icon only version. Any others? All right, I think I'm supposed to remind everyone that um, I guess you'll get an email uh, asking for feedback. So feedback encouraged. Uh, I love to lear learn and. Um, get my, make my speeches and talks better. And I'll, I'm happy to stick around at the end and, and talk to people individually. Thanks very much. <laughs>